Hi everyone, welcome to lecture two. So today we're gonna to be taking our first dive into trade theory and we're gonna be talking about the concept of comparative advantage and the Ricardian model. So just to motivate this a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit about um, you know, the big questions that um, we should all have in the back of our minds when we're thinking about trade theory. So one, we wanna understand the motivation for international trade. Why do countries trade? You know, What's in it for the people involved? Um, and that's just an important descriptive question. It's going to help us understand, you know, the state of the world and, and you know, what's at stake. But we also want to understand the implications of the patterns of international trade that we see in the world. So there's, um, there's two important things we want to think about in terms of the implications. One is the aggregate benefits um, or the gains from trade. So, you know, what's the total um, you know, gain from trade for the world or, you know, for the countries involved in aggregate. But we also want to understand the distribution. So which countries gain and which countries lose? Um, or within countries, you know, who is benefiting? Who is bearing the costs of trade? Um, so those are kind of abstract, but, you know, trade theory is also going to provide us some important tools for answering real world questions. So for example, um, since a 2000. So over the past 20 years, um, there's been, you know, this very rapid increase in trade with China. How has this affected U.S. income and U.S. inequality? Um, and, and, you know, we don't have to take a U.S. centric perspective with this. We could ask how this increased trade with China has affected Chinese income and Chinese inequality. Um, we could also think about NAFTA. So NAFTA is a free trade agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico um, that lowers tariffs. Um, on goods and services traveling between those borders and also, you know, reduces a lot of administrative burden. So it makes trade easier for these three countries. Um, and so how has that affected the countries that are involved or different people within these countries? More recently, um, post-2016, the United States increased tariffs on, um, on a lot of imports. Um, and, you know, it's a very important question as to how this has affected the United States overall different groups of workers, different groups of consumers, or how it's affected the countries um, that we raise tariffs on. So um, an important theme of trade theory um, that's gonna pop up over and over again is that countries trade because they are different. Um, and we actually have a formal way of characterizing the differences between these countries that matter for trade and determining the gains from trade. And it's what's called comparative advantage. And so a lot of this lecture today is just going to be, you know, defining comparative advantage and seeing exactly what that. And, and the big idea is that when there is comparative advantage, you know, people or countries can engage in specialization in trade. So specialization is, you know, you focus your productive resources on making what you have a comparative advantage in, and then you can trade. And so it's, it's um, uh, this, this specialization in trade, you know, taking advantage of, um, of differences in technology or resources or other things, that's gonna be the sources of gains from trade. So first let's start with a couple of definitions. Um, so comparative advantage, it, we're going to define that in terms of opportunity cost. And opportunity cost is what you give up to get something. So we're not thinking of just, you know, like prices, you know, but, or, um, you, you know, the direct cost of something, but it's all of the indirect costs, you know, so anything you do, you're giving up something to do that, you know, maybe it's time and you could have done something else with that time. So even if you're going to see a movie and it's free, you know, what could you have done with those two hours? That's the opportunity cost. So just a really simple example, um, you know, say there's two things that you care about, uh, bikes and nice dinners. And the price of a new bike is $250. So that's, you know, that's the cost. And the price of a nice dinner is $50. In terms of opportunity cost, though, if you were to get one bike, that's going to cost you $250. And you could have taken that same amount of money and bought five nice dinners. So that means that the opportunity cost of a bike is five nice dinners. Um, so to get one bike, you give up five meals. Um, <clears throat> And we're gonna apply the same concept to production and to countries. So a country is going to have a comparative advantage in producing a good when it has a lower opportunity cost of producing that good. So what we mean there is that when you produce a good, you always have to use some productive resources. You know, you have to take 
labor or capital or land, and you have to devote it to that sector to produce that good. And that means that you're not using those resources in another sector. And so you're reducing production in that other sector, shifting resources out of it. And the loss in production from that other sector, that's going to be the opportunity cost. And that's gonna be how we're gonna define comparative advantage. So let's see a simple example of this before we get to the full model. So this is an example that's just based on um, two people. And this is actually one of the secrets of trade theory. Um, you know, a lot of what we're doing is just taking, you know, really simple economic principles that apply to, you know, people or groups of people, but we're going to be applying them at the level of countries, you know, between countries. Um, so this is just two people, uh, Robert and Anna, and they are stranded on an island and they need to feed themselves. They're very lucky this island actually has two options for food. It's got coconut trees and it's got fishing. So um, let's say that, you know, they're not working together right now. It's, it's every man for themselves um, and they have to feed themselves. So um, <clears throat> um, they each have a productivity in, in either sector, the coconut sector or the fish sector. So if Robert spends his day um, harvesting coconuts, he can get 10. Uh, but if he spends his day harvesting fish, he can get six. And Anna, if she um, spends all of her time harvesting coconuts, she'll get 12, or she can spend her day fishing and she'll end up with four fish. Um, but you know, in actuality, they value a balanced diet. They like to have some coconut and some fish. So if they each are on their own, harvesting their own food, then Robert can have uh, five coconuts and three fish. So he's spending half his time harvesting coconuts, he gets five, half his time fishing, he gets three. And Anna gets six coconuts and two fish. Um, so now let's see what happens if they, if they work together, right? If they specialize and they trade with each other. Um, and, and so we wanna determine the direction of specialization. So we wanna see who has the comparative advantage in harvesting coconuts and who has the comparative advantage in harvesting fish. So before we get to comparative advantage, let's define another thing that we'll see later, um, which is absolute advantage. So um, it, it's pretty easy to see that Anna is better at harvesting coconuts. You know, she can harvest 12 in a day versus Robert's 10. So she's got the absolute advantage. Um, and then Robert has an absolute advantage in fishing. He's a more productive fisher because he gets six versus Anna's four. But for comparative advantage, we want to do this in terms of opportunity costs. So we want to know um, if, if uh, Robert wants one coconut, how many fish does he have to give up? If Anna wants one fish, how many coconuts does she have to give up? So, um, you know, if we look at the productivities, we see that if Anna spends her day fishing, she gains four fish, but she gives up 12 coconuts. And so if we divide there, we can see that the opportunity cost of one fish, is gonna be 12 divided by four, uh, sorry, that's a typo, um, and that's gonna be three coconuts. So every fish costs Anna three coconuts. We can do the same calculation for Robert. So if he um, spends his day fishing, he gets six fish, but he gives up 10 coconuts. And so the opportunity cost of fish is gonna be 10 divided by six, so it's 1.66 coconuts. So one fish costs Robert 1.66 coconuts and one fish costs Anna three coconuts. And that means that Robert has a lower opportunity cost of coconuts, or sorry, of fish. Um, and so he has the comparative advantage in fishing. You know, for one fish, he has to give up fewer coconuts. Um, and so we can also do the same for coconuts. So it's, it's just the same calculation, but in reverse, you know, how many fish does Robert have to give up to get one coconut? Well, he has to give up 0.6, um, 0.6 fish. And Anna has to give up 0.33 fish to get one coconut. And so um, in terms of opportunity cost, Anna um, has cheaper coconuts. So she has the comparative advantage in coconuts. So if they're gonna specialize based on comparative advantage, uh, Robert will spend his day fishing, Anna will spend her day harvesting coconuts. And if we look back at the productivities, that means that we'll end up with uh, six fish and 12 coconuts in total. And if they split those equally, 
then they can each have six coconuts and three fish. So before Robert had five coconuts and three fish. So he's now better off by one coconut. And Anna had six coconuts and two fish. So she's better off by one fish. And so by, um, by specializing in trading, by taking advantage of their comparative advantage, uh, which comes from their differences in opportunity costs, they're better off. There's a gain from trade. So, you know, they're better together than apart. Um, so that was a very simple example, but, you know, that same principle of, um, of uh, you know, comparative advantage and differences in opportunity costs leading to gains from trade um, is, is going to be the same in the more formal model that we're going to study now. So, um, and actually it's going to be the same in all the models that we're going to study pretty much. Um, so just a quick overview of that. Today we're going to be looking at the Ricardian model where comparative advantage is going to be based on differences in technology between countries. Next week, we're going to be looking at the hector olin model, where comparative advantage is going to be based on um, differences in factors of production. So you know, some countries have relatively more labor, some countries have relatively more capital, and what happens when they trade. Um, and, and then uh, in week three, we're going to be looking at economies of scale. So this is pretty interesting. The idea here is that specialization itself is what's going to generate the comparative advantage. So um, if you specialize in something, you get better at doing that, and that leads to differences in opportunity cost. Um, but today, it's, it's going to be very simple. The Ricardian model is the most straightforward model of comparative advantage because it's just differences in technology. Um, so just a little bit of intellectual history here. Um, the model we're studying today um, it was written down by David Ricardo in the early 1800s. Um, so a, a very dominant view at the time is something you've probably heard of, which is mercantilism. So this was the idea that, um, you know, what, what makes countries rich? It's how much gold they have. That, that was basically the idea at the time. Um, and so if you're thinking about that in terms of trade, um, then the implication is that uh, countries should be maximizing their trade surplus. So, you know, the, the, um, the goal of trade should be to have more exports relative to imports because then countries are giving you more money than you're giving them, you're getting more gold and that's what makes countries rich. Um, and Adam Smith actually spent a lot of time in uh, Wealth of Nations and some of his other writings uh, sort of refuting this idea and he came up with a theory of free trade uh, where countries are specializing based on their, um, their absolute advantage. Uh, so countries, you know, should be specializing um, based on what they're absolutely more productive in. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the theory there is it's, you know, countries are wealthy not because of how much gold they have, but because of how much stuff they can consume and trade lets you consume more stuff, as we just saw. Um, so it's really not about trade surpluses per se, but, you know, taking advantage of these differences and sharing and all that. Um, but then David Ricardo um, in the early 1800s, uh, improved this idea by showing that it's actually comparative advantage and not absolute advantage um, that's going to generate the, um, the differences in opportunity costs that lead to gains from trade. So same idea, you know, that, you know, countries are wealthy because of, you know, what they can consume, and, but it's just a refinement of, um, of the sources of the gains from trade. So, um, uh, the Ricardian model has a really simple environment. Uh, it's got two countries, two goods, and one factor of production. So it's just labor. Um, the production technology is defined by a constant labor productivity in each sector and a total supply of labor. So for today, we're gonna the two countries are going to be England and Portugal. The two goods are going to be cloth and wine. And each country is going to have 120 total units of labor. And you know, unit of labor, you can think about that as like um, uh, one person working for one day or something like that. Um, and we're going to define the technology or the productivity in terms of unit labor requirements. So a unit labor requirement is the amount of uh, labor that you need to produce one good. So um, we have this table here um, that's showing us the unit labor requirements. So in England, um, the unit labor requirement for cloth is eight. And that means it takes eight units of labor to make one unit of cloth. Uh, 
And then for wine, it takes 12 units of labor to make one unit of wine. So that's the unit labor requirement for wine. Um, and for Portugal, and, and by the way, throughout the course, you know, one notation thing that's we're going to use a lot is um, we're going to have the same variables here. So AC is the unit labor requirement for cloth, um, but we're going to have one country, you know, England in this case, just be, you know, their unit requirement is AC, but Portugal is AC star. So anything with a star here is going to be for Portugal. So AC star is six, which means it takes six units of labor to make one unit of cloth in Portugal. Uh, and it's also six for wine. So it takes six units of labor to make one unit of wine in Portugal. So one thing we can see right away is that Portugal has the absolute advantage in both sectors. It takes fewer units of labor to make cloth and fewer units of labor to make wine. So Portugal is just more productive overall. Um, however, we are going to see that even though Portugal has the absolute advantage in both sectors, there are still going to be gains from trade because there are differences in opportunity costs between these sectors. And that's what's gonna generate comparative advantage. So in terms of opportunity cost, uh, let's start with England. So in England, it takes 12 units of labor to produce one wine. If you take those same 12 units of labor and you instead use them in the cloth sector, um, that uh, th those 12 units would be able to produce 1.5 cloth. And so that means that the opportunity cost of wine for England is going to be 1.5, right? Um, producing that one wine with those 12 units of labor cost us 1.5 cloth. That's what England gave up to have that one unit of wine. Um, and we can also write this in terms of our uh, unit labor requirements. So, um, so the opportunity cost of wine is going to be AW over AC, which again is equal to 1.5. So we can do that same calculation in each sector. So in England, the opportunity cost of cloth is 0.66. That means that every unit of cloth costs 0.66 units of wine. And in Portugal, the opportunity cost, cost of cloth is one, and the opportunity cost of wine is one. So every cloth um, requires Portugal to give up one wine, and every wine requires Portugal to give up one cloth. And so when we compare these opportunity costs, we can see that in England, um, cloth is actually relatively cheaper. Getting an extra unit of cloth requires giving up fewer wine. So because the opportunity cost is lower, that means that England has a comparative advantage in cloth, and Portugal similarly has a comparative advantage in wine. So the price of wine in Portugal is only one cloth versus 1.5 cloth in England. So because we have this comparative advantage, there will be gains from trade, even though Portugal is more productive in both sectors. So to see the effects of trade, what we're first gonna do is look at the equilibrium in each economy in autarky. So that's our word for when we don't have any trade, you know, each country is self-sufficient. Um, then we're going to introduce trade, let the countries trade, and we're gonna compare outcomes. And one of the main tools we're gonna to use for this is what's called the production possibility frontier. So um, the production possibility frontier shows all of the possible bundles of goods that each economy can produce, given its technology and its endowment of uh, productive resources, which in this case is just labor. <clears throat> so over here, this is the production possibility frontier for England. England has 120 units of labor. Um, it costs them eight units of labor to make one cloth. So if we divide 120 by eight, we can see that they can make up to 15 cloth. And that's if they put all of their labor, labor, labor in the cloth sector. And similarly, if they put all of their labor in the wine sector, uh, 120 units of labor costs 12 units of labor to get one unit of wine. So that means they can get up to 10 units of wine. Um, or they could split their labor between the sectors and have something in between. So anything on this line is possible for England to produce, and this is the production possibility frontier. So here, for example, if they split their labor uh, equally across both sectors, so 60 units of labor in each, then um, they would produce seven and a half cloth and five units of wine. So this is a point on the production possibility frontier. <clears throat> 
Um, so what's happening when we're moving along the production possibility frontier? Well, what we're doing is we're reallocating labor from, if we're starting up at this point, we've got all our labor in the cloth sector. Then if we move down here, we're moving some labor from the cloth sector into the wine sector. So we're giving up some cloth, right? So over here is lower on the cloth line, but we're gaining some wine. And so the opportunity cost tells us exactly how much cloth we have to give up to get that extra unit of wine. Um, and another word for this in terms of production is the rate of technical substitution. It's the rate of technical substitution because we're using our technology to actually exchange cloth for wine. So we're reallocating our productive resources and using technology um, to make that trade. Um, and, and so because the, you know, the opportunity cost tells us exactly how much uh, cloth we have to give up to get one unit of wine, then the slope of the production possibility frontier is gonna be exactly equal to the opportunity cost of wine. So to get one extra unit of wine, we have to give up 1.5 cloth, which means that the slope of this line is gonna be minus 1.5. Um, and just one other note, you know, um, anything inside this triangle is possible for England to produce, but it wouldn't use all of their labor. So anything on this line uses all of their labor endowment. And so we're, we're really just gonna focus on the frontier of this line itself. So even though this is possible, um, it, you know, say you wanted to consume equal amounts of cloth and wine, you know, yeah, you could make this point, but you can also make more cloth and more wine because you have extra labor left over. So we're really just interested in the frontier. Um, so remember, we wanted to find the domestic equilibrium. And there's two main things in the domestic equilibrium that we care about. We care about prices and we care about quantities. Um, since we're studying real outcomes, you know, we're just interested in stuff here. Um, we're going to be looking at relative prices. So this is going to be the price of each good in terms of the price of the other good. So um, the relative price of the cloth is going to be the price of cloth divided by the price of wine and the relative price of wine is vice versa. It's PW over PC. So for example, if the price of wine is $5, price of cloth is $10, that means that the relative price of cloth is gonna be 10 divided by five, so it's gonna be two. So cloth costs twice as much as wine. But the relative price would be two um, if the price of wine was $10 and the price of cloth was $20. So we don't need to pin down the exact price levels because we don't really have anything that would be able to distinguish that in this model, um, but we can pin down the relative prices. And to do that, we're going to use an assumption about the labor market. So remember, labor is our only productive resource. How much labor um, that is being used in each sector is going to tell us everything about production in that economy. And to determine how much labor is in each sector, um, we're going to use an assumption of perfect labor mobility. The idea here is that workers can move freely between each sector. It's, it's totally up to them. So um, I think the easiest way to think about this is to think of each unit of labor as a separate worker that you know, wakes up every morning and decides whether to produce cloth or wine. And what they get at the end of the day, their wage is actually their real output. And their real output is like physically how much cloth did you make that day? Like that's what you take home. Or physically how much wine did you make that day? That's what you take home. But then you get to go and sell that wine or that cloth on the market. Um, and in exchange, you get the price of that. And labor is perfectly mobile. So workers wake up in the morning and they decide which sector to work in. And if one sector is more valuable than the other, you know, if your real output times the price um, is higher in one sector than the other, then every worker is gonna decide to work in that sector. But if that's the case, then we don't have any of the other good and so it, it doesn't even have a price. There's no market for it. And so to have production in each sector, to have this domestic equilibrium, we have to have um, production in each sector to have the, the same total value. And so if you work in the wine sector, um, you know, remember the unit labor requirement is 12. So if you just have your one unit of labor and you, you work in the wine sector, you've got one twelfth of a unit of wine and you can sell that for the price of wine. So the total value you get is PW times one over 12. 
And if you work in the cloth sector, you get the price of cloth times one over eight. And these two values must be equal. Um, and that's the only case in which we're gonna have workers in both sector. And this equation allows us to solve for the relative price. Um, so for example, the relative price of wine, that's gonna be PW over PC. Um, if we just solve this equation, um, that's, you know, divide by PC over here, multiply by 12 over here, we get that the relative price of wine is 12 over eight or 1.5. Um, and we can also put this in terms of unit labor requirements. Um, so this is an equation that you should keep in mind. And so something interesting has happened. Um, in autarky, the domestic relative price is exactly equal to the opportunity cost. So the domestic price of wine that's gonna sustain an equilibrium is 1.5. And that's exactly equal to the opportunity cost that we found a few slides ago. And it's going to be the same for cloth. If we flip this, we'll see that the opportunity cost, cost of cloth was 0.66. And that's going to be equal to the relative price of cloth in the autarky equilibrium. Um, so now that, now that we know prices, um, we want to pin down actual quantities. So we, we know production. We know everything the economy can produce. Uh, but we also want to think about consumption. So in autarky, this is very simple. Um, we're going to use. Um, something called the consumption possibility frontier. Uh, remember that the, the production possibility frontier, the PPF told us all possible production bundles. Well, the consumption possibility frontier or the CPF is gonna tell us all possible consumption bundles, You know everything you can consume. Well, in autarky, there's no trade. The only way to obtain cloth or wine is to produce it. And so the CPF is gonna be exactly equal to the PPF. And so remember that the slope of the PPF was equal to the opportunity cost of wine. So that was the rate of technical substitution. Um, so as we move along the PPF, we're moving resources from one sector to the other. And we do that um, at a rate that the opportunity cost tells us. Well, when we move along the CPF, what we're doing is, is we're, we're actually trading in the domestic market, right? We're taking cloth that we made and we're selling it for wine. Um, but the price of wine is exactly equal to the opportunity cost of wine in equilibrium. So the CPF and the PPF have the same slope, but they are actually telling us different things. It's the opportunity cost versus the domestic price. Um, and again, the CPF is just telling us all the possible bundles, um, but you know, which bundle will they actually consume? Well, it depends on domestic demand. And that's something, you know, we could make an assumption about the demand curve, but it's, it's gonna be pretty arbitrary at this point. So we're just gonna say that, you know, this is, this is everything they could possibly consume. Um, and so, you know, for example, you could say something like, you know, they wanna have equal quantities of uh, cloth and wine, and that would be something like this point here. But it might be that, you know, people in this economy like wine more than cloth, and it could be this point here. But, um, you know, in either case, um, the main lesson is that this tells us, you know, the options that people have in the economy. Um, and we're, we're going to look at how those options change once we have trade. Um, so for Portugal, we can do the exact same thing. We want to define the autarky equilibrium. We want to look at the PPF, the CPF, and domestic prices. So Portugal has the same 120 units of labor. And we're going to use their um, unit labor requirements to find the endpoints of their production possibility frontier. So it costs them six units of labor to make one cloth or one wine. So just doing some division there shows that they can make up to 20 cloth or up to 20 wine or something in between. So anything along the production possibility frontier. Um, now the opportunity cost of wine is lower for Portugal. Um, so it's just one cloth. So remember this line, you know, what happens when we're moving along here is we're giving up cloth in order to get more wine. And so the slope here is the opportunity cost of wine. So the slope of the PPF is just going to be one. Now we know um, that in the autarky equilibrium, the domestic price has got to be equal to the opportunity cost. And so we can also summarize the domestic prices for England and Portugal here. So, you know, England, we already saw these. In Portugal, the domestic prices, um, the relative prices are just going to be one. So one cloth costs one wine and one and vice versa. 
And by comparing these domestic prices, we can see that um, you know, prior to trade, England um, is a low cost producer of, of cloth and Portugal is a low cost producer of wine. So now when we introduce trade, um, <clears throat> um, we're gonna wanna look at the same set of outcomes and then compare them to the autarky equilibrium so we can see what's changed and whether or not these countries are better off. So we just saw that in autarky, we had different domestic prices in England and in Portugal. Once trade opens, we're gonna make an assumption called the law of one price. And this means that um, we're going to assume that there's a single global price in the trade equilibrium. So to justify this, consider what happens as soon as trade opens. Remember that we just saw that England was a low cost producer of cloth. So for each unit of cloth, they could get 66 cents um, by selling it on the domestic market. Now the trade is open. If you're an English cloth producer, you can also take that same unit of cloth and sell it on the export market in Portugal for $1. Um, and that's a good deal. That's a better price than you were getting before. And so you as a cloth producer would prefer to export your cloth to Portugal and you'll do so. Um, but all the other cloth producers are thinking the same thing. They're thinking, wow, you know, I, I was only getting 66 cents for this, um, this cloth before, now I can get a dollar. I'm also gonna export. And so <clears throat> what's happening is that the supply of cloth in Portugal is increasing. And as the supply of cloth increases, that's gonna push the price down in Portugal. And also there's gonna be fewer cloth in, in the domestic market in England because it's now going to the export market. So the supply of cloth in England is decreasing and that's gonna push the price up. And this process is gonna continue until those prices are equal, until, the, um, until we have one single global price that's the same in the domestic and the export market. And the same thing is gonna happen in the wine sector in reverse. You know, in Portugal, you were getting a price of one for your wine before, but now you can sell that to England for a price of 1.5. So we're gonna see exports in the wine sector, um, but that's gonna lower the price of wine in England, raise the price of wine in Portugal, and it's gonna continue until they meet. And so we're gonna have an equilibrium price that's somewhere between these two initial um, autarky prices. So, um, to figure out exactly what's happening in the global market, we're gonna use a tool that's called the global relative supply curve. So this is gonna tell us for a given uh, global relative price, remember we just talked about the global relative price and how we're gonna get there and the range that it's gonna be. So this here is the global relative supply curve for cloth. The two domestic prices for cloth that we started with in autarky were 0.66 um, in England and one in Portugal. And so the global price in the trade equilibrium is gonna be somewhere between those two. And then on the x-axis here, we have the relative quantity of cloth. So this is gonna be the total cloth that's consumed in the world divided by the total wine that's consumed in the world. Um, and so at each price, what we're gonna do is plot out the global relative supply. So this is the supply curve. And then, you know, there's gonna be a global relative demand curve. This is kind of arbitrary. Um, so we'll see what happens at different demand curves, right? Because where these two curves intersect is gonna tell us what exactly the equilibrium global price is and different supply. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna see different supply depending on what price we actually settle at. Um, so first suppose that the, um, the global uh, relative price of cloth is 0.66. Well, at this point, you know, this was the, the domestic autarky price of cloth in England. And um, we already know that at that price, English workers were indifferent between producing wine and cloth. They had the same value. Um, so they could be, they could be producing anywhere along their production possibility frontier. Over here, they could be pre-producing all cloth, all wine, something in between. The point is that they're different. In Portugal though, um, a price of 0.66 is too low to incentivize anyone to produce cloth. Remember that Portugal has a comparative advantage in wine, they're relatively worse at producing cloth. 
And so the price that made workers indifferent between producing cloth and wine was one. And 66 cents is just too low. The cloth sector, um, working in the cloth sector is just not valuable enough to actually incentivize anyone to want to do it. And so every Portuguese worker is going to want to work in the wine sector. And so Portugal is going to completely specialize in wine and England is going to produce, you know, some wine and some cloth. So we're going to see incomplete specialization. So if the price was down here at 0.66, um, Portugal is producing all wine. So we know the total quantity of wine in the world, um, but England is going to be producing some amount of both. So, and it really just depends on how much demand, you know, total demand there is for cloth. Um, and we would be able to figure it out based on where the demand curve intersected, but we would, you know, we know that there's going to be zero Portuguese cloth, but it just depends on how much English cloth there is. That, that will tell us the relative quantity. So if the relative price was of cloth was one, we would have the reverse. So we would be up here now. Um, in England, you know, now producing cloth is, is actually very valuable. You know, the real wage in the cloth sector is actually, or in the wine sector is actually, uh, sorry, in the cloth sector is actually very high. Um, because you know one is higher than the domestic price, so cloth is um, you know you get a higher price for selling it, and so every English worker wants to work in the cloth sector. But that relative price of one is what made Portuguese workers indifferent between working in the cloth sector and the wine sector. So you know some will work in both, and again we'll have incomplete specialization, but in the other direction. England is completely specialized in cloth. Portugal is partially specialized, or you know not specialized. Um, but for any price that's between those, so for any price within this range, uh, you know, it could be 0.67, it could be 0.99, it could be 0.8, we'll have complete specialization. So there, the price of cloth is high enough that every English worker wants to work in the cloth sector, but it's also low enough that no Portuguese workers want to work in the cloth sector. Um, and every Portuguese worker wants to work in the wine sector. So when the price is between the two domestic autarky prices, we'll have complete specialization. So any price within here, we have complete specialization. And they're, they're completely specializing in the good that they have comparative advantage in. So, you know, the idea here is that, um, you know, in England, 0.66 was the only price where workers were indifferent um, between producing cloth and wine. And if the price of cloth is any higher, now the cloth sector is just more valuable and it's the opposite in, in uh, Portugal. Um, and the quantity here is gonna be fixed because we have complete specialization at any price within this range. So um, England is producing 15 cloth. That's what they get if all their workers are in the cloth sector. Portugal is producing 20 wine. That's what they get if all their workers are in the wine sector. And you know the, we could calculate the the relative quantity too. So here it would be 15 over 20 or 0.75. But really, the the absolute numbers are mostly what we're going to be concerned with. Um, but what equilibrium price are we going to settle at? You know, anything in this range gets us complete specialization. But you know where we actually intersect here depends on the exact demand curve. So this is just you know an arbitrary demand curve that I drew. It could be higher, and the price of cloth would be higher could be lower and the price of wine would be higher. So, so now that we've defined the global equilibrium, we know the supply um, at any given price, we're gonna see how this affects each country. So we're gonna, we're gonna return to our production possibility frontier and our consumption possibility frontier. And we're gonna use those to see um, how options for consumption have changed now that we can trade. So we know the PPF hasn't changed, the technology hasn't changed, but we do have um, an extra um, way of getting um, additional goods if we want them. So before, you know, if we were producing cloth and we wanted more wine, the only way to do it was technically, right? If England needed wanted more wine, it had to reallocate workers from the cloth sector to the wine sector. But now, um, even if it's fully specialized in cloth, it's producing 15 cloth with all, with all of its workers, they can take that cloth and trade it on the global market for wine. And they can do that at the global price. So suppose that the equilibrium global relative price of cloth is 0.8. Um, 
So that's within the range of complete specialization. So England is producing all cloth, Portugal is producing all wine. Um, and here it's actually gonna be a little bit easier to work with the price of wine in some cases. So that's gonna be uh, 1.25. And you know, remember the relative price is just PC over PW. So we can just flip that um, to get the relative price of wine. And that's gonna be 1.25. So uh, starting with England, um, they're completely specialized. They're producing 15 cloth and they can sell each of those cloths for uh, 0.8 wine per unit of cloth. And so if they take all 15 and they trade them all for wine, uh, that gives them 15 times 0.8 or 12 wine. So that's out here. And as we can see, that's actually two more wine than was possible for England to consume in autarky. So the production possibility frontier hasn't moved, but the consumption possibility frontier has actually shifted out. And that shift out, um, uh, you know, this difference between the CPF and the PPF, that is the gain from trade. So for example, you know, if we wanted to consume, you know, a proportion of wine and cloth that was equal, we'd be somewhere along the line about here in the middle. Um, we used to be able to consume this much. So that was seven and a half and five. Now we can consume a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, of both resources. So that's England's gain from trade. Um, so as you can see, Portugal is a little bit more complicated. We've got something funny going on with their uh, consumption possibility frontier. Um, so what's going on here is, you know, they're completely specialized. They're producing 20 wine and they can sell each of those units of wine uh, at a price of 1.25 cloth per wine. But remember that the world only has 15 cloth. You know, they're fully specialized. So um, England is producing 15 cloth and so they can only trade for up to 15 cloth. So here, you know, they're starting with 20 wine um, and they're moving along the consumption possibility frontier by trading at the global relative price so this line has a slope of uh, minus 1.25. So they get 1.25 units of cloth for each wine. They're trading more and more cloth for wine, uh, more giving up more wine, getting more cloth. And they keep doing that until there's no more uh, cloth that's left to trade for. So at that point, they've bought all the cloth that's in the world, which is 15. And um, if you do the algebra here, you can see that they that cost them uh, 12 wine. So at this point, Portugal can consume eight wine and 15 cloth. If they wanted to have less wine and more cloth, you know, if that was the consumption bundle that they wanted to prefer, they actually have to move along the PPF now because the only way for them to get more is to use their technology, you know, to reallocate workers from the wine sector to the cloth sector. So from this point, they're moving along the, um, um, the production possibility frontier. So, um, so in this example, we saw that both countries were better off by trading. And this was the case, even though Portugal has an absolute advantage in both sectors. And the reason is that the source of the gain from trade is specialization based on their comparative advantage. So even though we have this um, absolute advantage of Portugal in both sectors. The differences in opportunity costs mean that there's a comparative advantage and that's the source of the gains from trade. Um, however, this was a price that created gains from trade for both countries. And that's not always going to be the case. So how the total gain from trade is distributed between countries depends on the equilibrium world price. So to see this, suppose that the equilibrium relative price of cloth was one in the trade equilibrium. So let's start with England. We know that they're producing um, 15 cloth uh, and they can sell each cloth for one unit of wine now. So they're getting a higher price for their cloth than before. And so that's good for them, right? They're producing cloth, they're selling it. You wanna get a, a high price for what you're selling. And so if they're selling one for one, they can take that 15 cloth and they can trade it for up to 15 wine. So their gain from trade is actually even larger. When the price of cloth was only 0.8, they could get up to 12 wine. Now they can get up to 15 wine. So England's gain from trade is larger. However, 
If we look at Portugal's uh, consumption possibility frontier, they're producing, um, you know, say they're fully specialized, they're producing 20 wine, they can trade that wine for cloth and they're doing so at a relative um, global price of one, but that's exactly the same as their domestic opportunity cost, the rate of technical substitution. And so their CPF is exactly the same as their PPF. They're no better off than they were in autarky. Now they're not worse off, but there is actually no gain from trade for Portugal. And the reason is because the global equilibrium price that we settled on was exactly equal to their domestic autarky price. Um, and so in this case, England captures the entire gain from trade. If we did this the other way around, if the relative price of cloth was 0.66, then there would be no gain from trade for England because um, the relative price would have the same slope as the production possibility frontier, but Portugal would capture the entire gain from trade. So Portugal would have a, a larger gain from trade in that case. And in general, countries have larger gains from trade when the price of their export, their export good is higher. So we know the prices are gonna be somewhere between the two domestic um, autarky prices, but um, you know where it lands in that is going to affect the distribution of gains from trade and countries are gonna be better off when the price of what they're selling is higher. So uh, this example actually helps us understand the sources of the gains from trade better. Um, and the reason is this. So the gains from trade exist because of differences in opportunity cost of production between each countries. You know, countries trade because they're different. And in a way, it means that trade is essentially of a way of using other countries' technology. It's like importing their opportunity costs. So if we look at this example here, what we've done for England is we've actually just imported Portugal's opportunity cost, right? England has this domestic opportunity cost of point, um, you know, this has the slope of minus 1.5. That was the opportunity cost of wine. And that's if England uses its own technology. But at this global relative price, when it's exactly equal to Portugal's domestic autarky price, this line, the CPF, has exactly the same slope as Portugal's PPF. So it's like England is, is using Portugal's technology. Now, if they want wine, they have um, the option to use their own technology, move along the possibility, the production possibility frontier, or they're moving along this line, which is basically Portugal's production possibility frontier. And so if countries have the same opportunity costs, you know, if their PPFs had the same slope, then trade doesn't change relative prices and there would be no gain from trade for anyone. So it's this change in relative prices that generates the gain from trade. And of course, the more different countries are, you know, the larger the difference is in opportunity costs, there's more comparative advantage than the larger the total gain from trade is. But again, we still have, um, you know, where the exact equilibrium price is, is gonna determine um, how much of that gain from trade that each country gets. And, and so lastly, you know, one thing to get you guys thinking is that there's another way to interpret um, this last example. So what if we imagine that England was a very small country and Portugal was a very large country? So um, we actually have the, the means to do this in our simple Ricardian model. Um, we could do this through the unit labor endowment. So we assume that each country both had 120 units of labor, but what if Portugal had 1,200 and England had 12? Um, so for England, you know, opening trade to Portugal, that would be that would be a huge deal, It'd be a big shift in the supply and demand of, of um, cloth and wine. And specifically, you know, now there's this huge export market for cloth, and there's this huge import market for wine. So Portuguese wine is a very big deal. Portuguese cloth is a very big deal. And so England's domestic market is now just totally dwarfed by Portugal's. And so, you know, the global market, um, they're um, domestic prices are really just going to reflect Portugal's. Um, but for Portugal, you know, opening trade to England doesn't really shift much just because it's so small. You know, there might be these big differences in opportunity costs, but um, just because there's only so much labor in the other country, there's not much to actually take advantage of. And so the extra supply of cloth or demand for wine would be pretty negligible. Um, so Portuguese domestic prices don't really change and there's very little or no gain from trade. So this is one potential reason why 
trade for, is more important for smaller countries, or, or we could say more impactful for smaller countries. So, you know, for a country like, um, uh, you say, um, Mallorca, it's like a small Mediterranean island, you know, trade with the rest of Europe is, is huge, it's tremendously important for it, but the rest of Europe could just, you know, forget about Mallorca, it's, it just makes such a very a small impact on their market. Um, another reason that trade can be more important for smaller countries is that there can be greater opportunities for specialization in trade by going out onto the global market. So what I mean by this is that in large countries, um, there's more likely to be domestic diversity in the economy. So there can be domestic differences in opportunity costs between cities or regions or other groups that can support internal specialization in trade. So for example, United States, you know, these are sort of stereotypes, but we have a predominantly industrial Northeast, agricultural Midwest, and we have this really dominant entertainment sector um, in LA. So we've got this regional specialization in trade that we can take advantage of domestically because there are these internal differences. But for small countries, there are fewer domestic differences to take advantage of in the first place. So the gain from opening up trade to the rest of the world can allow them to take advantage of their differences from the rest of the world. So, um, you know, just by virtue of large countries being large, um, there are less likely to be fewer opportunities for, uh, there's, it's more likely that large countries have fewer opportunities for specialization and trade with the rest of the world, just because they've already taken advantage of them domestically. But for small countries, um, it would actually be the opposite. So um, that was it for today um, or for this lecture. Um, and so, uh,